Hello, everyone. So we are live now. Uh, welcome to today's uh, Tech Excellence Meetup. So our vision is to raise the bar of technical excellence across the world. And this is a short overview of our um, current speakers as well as upcoming speakers. And also uh, feel free to join us on Meetup so that you can get notified about our events. Also, you can uh, watch our Meetup sessions on YouTube and follow us on uh, LinkedIn uh, as well as uh, Twitter. So we're uh, looking forward to uh, future Meetups. Now, for today, I'm really excited that Michele Solecito will be uh, joining us to present a really interesting topic. So it will be test-driven development and other agile practices within software product delivery. So looking at this from a, a systemic uh, perspective, I'm sure that many people will have uh, lots of questions because these topics are spanning organizational and technical. So really the whole system. Uh, please feel free to write any questions that you have uh, in chat uh, because later during the Q&A session, we will be going through questions from the chat. So uh, I guess we can uh, start now. All so right. maybe firstly, yeah, um, we could start off with the whole uh, systems uh, thinking. Perhaps you could give us some kind of uh, introduction regarding this and why it matters. Yeah. So first of all, hi, everybody. I mean, thanks for showing up. And thanks, Valentina. I mean, I'm actually honored to be here. You know, I've been following like your posts on LinkedIn and Twitter for a while. And, you know, I'm quite impressed by how you can you know, really talk about technical things and build an audience. So, you know, once again, it's a pleasure being here, right? So why are we talking about systems thinking? Well, we're talking about system thinking because I keep seeing like many companies where a lot of people work very hard and they're very smart people. And yet, you know, sometimes the outcomes simply fail to materialize you know, it got me thinking, right? And I read a lot and I got another perspective. And so I think I got a bit of a diagnosis of a problem that's affecting our industry in product software development, right? And so the whole idea with system thinking is there's different ways of looking at reality, right? And so if you go like an analytical or reductionist mindset or what is called a mechanicistic mindset, you see reality as little units which you can compose and you think that you can infer properties of a big picture thing by the properties of these small blocks, right? So let's give an example. So if I take, uh, I don't know, a bag of oranges and I know mm -hmm. the volume and weight of each of the oranges, well, I can fairly confidently determine the volume maybe, but definitely the weight of the bag of oranges, right? And this is possible because a bag of oranges is actually not a system, right? And while for bag of oranges, this works, for systems, it doesn't work and it can be quite dangerous, right? So let me define a minute what I mean by system. And then we can probably start having a chapter around how it affects uh, software yes. product delivery, right? So, I mean, whatever I'm about to say in the next hour or so, I mean, obviously it's not stuff I came up with, you know, I happen to read quite a bit. So if you guys spot anything or listen to anything that somebody else said, the answer is yes. It wasn't my own, you know, quotes and stuff like that, right? So first and foremost, I mean, when, when I talk about systems, the canonical definition of a system is basically a whole, like a thing, which is composed by parts each of which can affect the behavior and the properties of the system, right? And so each part of the system, when it affects the system, is dependent for the effect it brings on some other part. So if you consider a bag of oranges, the first part of this definition is still holds, right? So in a bag of oranges, you got oranges, which are parts, fair enough. And each of them can affect the behavior of the properties of the bag of oranges, so the volume and the weight, right? But in this case, the parts are not interdependent. 
So basically, if I take out an orange, I still have a bag of oranges and the properties are still the same, right? While in a system, the parts are interdependent. So no part of a system has an independent effect on the system, right? So and what that means is that a system cannot be divided into independent parts. Now, why is this important? Well, it's important because what it means is that a system has properties that none of the parts have, right? And so as an example, if you make a famous example, this one was used by Russell Eckhoff a lot. If you consider a car, right? You could say that the fundamental property of a car is that it can take you from one place to another. And yet no part of a car can do that, right? So as an example, the engine itself cannot take you from one place to another. It actually can't even take itself from one place to another, funny enough. And you know, like the windshield cannot, and the wheels cannot, and the axle cannot, right? So the ability to move you from a place to another is a property of a whole, right? And so if you deassemble a car into its parts, that system, while the parts are still over there, it loses its essential property, which means it cannot carry you from one place to another, right? And you know, you can think, your brain cannot think, you can write, your hand cannot write, right? And so there's different types of systems, and these are very recurring in you know software product delivery. And so as an example, a machine, like a computer, as an example, is a system. You know, there are distributed systems, they're called systems for a reason. You know, there's people. So me, you, we're all systems, right? You got a heart, you got the lungs, and you know, the way they interact determines whether you're real or not, right? And there are other, other higher order systems. So as an example, a team is a system, a department is a system, a process is a system, and so on, right? And ultimately, a company is a system. So what am I getting with all of this? Well, the problem is that if you treat a system like the sum of its parts, you will do some fundamental mistakes when it comes to management and organizing processes because the performance of a system is never the sum of the parts. But it's actually the product of the interactions, right? And so going back to this, there are some examples where if you treat a team like a collection of people, it will create some problems. Like a bag of apples. In other, in other words, to, to, to summarize, we can't treat uh, a department or, uh, as essentially like treating a people, a set of people as a, as like a set of apples because the overall, I guess, uh, outcome of, of the system is their interactions and all the interdependencies. Um, Unlike an apple in a bag, like we, we can take it out but we're not changing the essence of the bag but here if we take out one person or add another one it, it changes the whole dynamic so we can say it's more the dynamic i guess uh aspect of it yeah yeah absolutely correct right and it's not even just about taking people in and out but it's like so the fundamental properties of a system cannot be inferred by looking at the parts so as an example when Toyota and, you know, the Japanese car industry was raging in, in the 90s and 80s and they were basically like destroying the American car market. Well, you know, there were actually allegedly people in automotive companies in the US which bought one of these Japanese cars because they couldn't understand why this car was so much better and so tougher than their own cars, right? And they took it down into pieces. And they compare the wheels with their wheels, and their wheels were better. And they compare the engine with their engine, and their engine was better, and so on. But overall, the car was better because those parts worked better together compared to the American counterparts, right? And so this is another aspect, right? You can't build teams by saying, oh, a team is a collection of good people, so the team will work well. It's absolutely false. Right, and so on. So it's something we can yeah. talk about in a minute, I guess. Uh, yeah, I guess it's similar like in sports. Uh, we can't predict the performance mm -hmm. of the team from, from just looking at the star players, but they have to know uh, how to actually uh, mm -hmm. play together um, and actually work, working as a team. Yeah. 
And yeah. the whole aspect, how you mentioned that it's not just a sum, but it's actually the product of the interactions, which is much, much greater uh, than the actual sum. So I guess this brings us uh, to, you know, the next next question. Why should anyone care, you know, about this difference? Like, what's the impact on effectiveness or, yeah. or efficiency or quality and speed if if we have these two, uh, I guess, different different perspectives? So I'm sure here in the audience that people who are working in leadership positions, so why should they even care about this topic? Yeah, I mean, I, we, I guess we'll touch on leadership later on as well and trying to work into, you know, the difference between management and leadership. Basically, the whole idea is you should care because given that, you know, once again, the performance of a system, so the performance of a company or a department or a process or a team depend on all the other parts and how these parts work together, you can have a situation where in a company the parts work splendidly well so as an example, each single person works amazingly well. Each simple step in a process is great. And yet the processes and the department work terribly wrong. Right. And so it's absolutely fundamental. You know, there's a distinction between efficiency and effectiveness. Right. So efficiency is doing the thing right. So I'm doing something. If I'm doing it right, I'm efficient or, you know, good at it somehow. Now, effectiveness is doing the right thing. Right. And you know how Peter Drucker used to say, doing the wrong thing right is not nearly as good as doing the right thing wrong. Right? Arguably, if you're really efficient at doing the wrong thing, well, it will take you in a wrong, even wronger place, right? And it's the same as putting, I don't know, two world-class canoeing sports people on a canoe, and they are actually canoeing, but in different opposite directions. They're doing a great job individually, but you know, as a system, it's kind of a little bit poor. And so, you know, to an extent, you should care because the outcomes you get, and, you know, when we can talk about CICD, which being a process is obviously a system, and in that case, it's very visible, <clears throat> is the product of the interactions of the parts, never the sum, right? And so, yeah, That's absolutely. I guess we could then uh, summarize, I mean, link linking to what, what you said, ultimately, uh, we can say that the whole company success, which in fact is the main thing that that leadership should should care about, it's it's at the level of uh, the whole organization, because at the end of the year the CEO will will not ask uh, what was the performance of like John Smith in the company, but rather what was the performance of the company uh, as a whole. So uh, I guess this brings us to the goal of um, the only thing that actually matters is how the whole thing performs mm -hmm. together but that's yeah. the only actually valuable measurement of anything yeah yeah absolutely right and, and you know there's different types of systems right as an example a computer is a machine right and it's called a machine because is his only purpose is to serve its masters right so if this is my laptop his entire reason of existence is to make me happy right but then when you go on to different types of system, like as an example, a person, well, that's not the case. So even if you as a person work for a company, you got goals and ambitions of your own, right? And, and why is a person different? Well, the next level, which is called a team or a social system, a team is an example of a social system, is made by parts who also has individual goals and aspirations, right? And so the whole, the whole point is, you know, there's also a different view of a company from a strategic point of view is the goal of the company to provide for his shareholders as much money as possible, or is the goal of the, so basically it boils down to this, is the part of purpose of a company to make money and the company needs to survive in order to make money, or is the other way around, or is the purpose of the company to survive and making money and profits is a condition that's necessary for that, or you know, giving money to shareholders is a condition necessary to do that, right? And, and this is the root of the whole thinking, right? So as an example, a lot of strategic decisions, you know, short-term versus long-term thinking boil down to this, right? And if you got short-term thinking, you're always talking about the next quarter or the next year, some things are just out of your reach. 
Uh, yeah, ex exactly. I think that that was a really good summary how you boiled it down to actually shareholder value, and one key economic benefit of systems thinking is it actually helps us also later optimize shareholder value as well. Now, previously we had touched upon the topics of regarding leadership uh, versus management, um, and what is management work. Okay, so uh, I will repeat the last point. Uh, we had touched upon the topic of leadership versus uh, management and what's the difference uh, between them. So maybe if you could go into those yeah, yeah. ones more. Yeah, it's a really good question. You know, a lot of people have a lot of confusion about this and, you know, companies love slogans and things like that, right? And, you know, in some companies, management has a very negative connotation, right? So companies be like, oh, we don't need managers, which is absolutely ridiculous. Of course, you do need managers and <laughs> get there in a sec. But the point is, is not, and why? is because a lot of companies treat managers as, especially mid middle management, as some sort of like decision makers for the day to day, right? So if there's a team of software engineers and whatnot, the manager will be make most decisions, right? And mm -hmm. those people just do whatever they're told, which is not obviously what I advocate for, right? But the whole idea in management is that if it's so important that, you know, the parts of this system and various subsystems within a company, so the various processes, teams, and pipelines and software systems, they need to work well together, then the role of management is to make sure that they do is to design systems and subsystems and the interactions so that they do perform well. And to an extent, the job of management is not to manage what the employees do, you know, how they act, but it's how they interact, right? It's how to structure effective processes, incentives, and we'll get to that later on, you know, yeah. so that everybody does what's best for the company in a way that is harmonious and you know you actually deliver performance so in terms of leadership leadership is a different thing so management typically is a role so you're a manager and what that means is that that's your responsibility as part of management right and so you coordinate these and fight against entropy and inertia and so on while leadership leadership is is a property of a person that a person can exhibit at times right so leader should never be a role so you can assume leadership in specific circumstances when you want to, when you feel like it, when you're confident about something, and it's spontaneous. As in, people attribute leadership is not something you can get in virtual at all, right? Uh, yes, uh, I think this this is a good distinction, uh, especially drawing previously how you explained the point of management instead of micromanaging individual people like micromanaging individual parts or assigning work to ta uh, to the team instead they should focus actually on the system so the stuff which is between the parts and let the parts themselves yeah. figure out how, how to optimize um uh, themselves but instead they provide the bigger uh, system so they're actually design, designing the system and processes. So that, that's a really, really great way of defining management. And it's true, uh, how should I, proper role. And the other point about leadership that essentially, so as you mentioned, management is a role, but leadership is actually something uh, spontaneous. We can't ever say, okay, you will now be a leader. Mm -hmm. so it's, it's actually up to the person and it's up to the situation that they're in. And I guess there's a whole other topic of situational leadership, which is beyond this discussion, which is the whole thing about uh, di different situations. Um, in any case, uh, since you mentioned, you know, um, uh, that essentially the teams them themselves should decide how to do work, could you maybe elaborate a bit more about decentralizing decisions okay. uh, and autonomy and alignment? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, Yes, yeah, that's a really good point and question. So basically the point is, okay, but if managers are not making decisions, who does, right? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, this, you know, varies. And what I'm bound to say is obviously, you know, I stress that it's just my personal opinion. But, you know, in general, I'm biased for teams of equals 
that are cross-functional and they make every single decision about the day-to-day -day with a caveat, which is if a decision is irreversible and can cause far-fetching consequences, then senior management might veto it. But senior managers should still refrain from making decisions. They should just say, hey, guys, wait a minute. Let's rethink this thing because, you know, it's a bit scary. So we want to find a way to reduce the risk, right? And, and the whole point is, you know, why we're talking about centralized versus decentralized control and decisions, right? Well, because in a lot of companies, for some reasons, and this is probably cultural, it comes from military, you know, like in, in companies, people are called officers at executive level, which is a little bit funny. But the thing is, you know, if you're chief technology officer, that officer there come from a military context, right? And so, you know, funny enough, even military abandoned centralized control ages ago. So today, if you go in military and ask how it actually works, you know, it's not like how the movies show it, right? In the movies, people get orders and they need to do exactly what they're told, which is ridiculous and how it works. And, and the reason why it doesn't work and why they abandon it is because you introduce a big delay. Right. So here the problem is this. If I'm on the field, whether I'm in a battle or writing some code, the problem is I will encounter some decisions and I make decisions all the time. Big, small, far fetching consequences and, you know, trivial consequences. Right. And the problem is if every time there's two, three problems. First of all, I don't exactly know which decisions I should make as opposed to which decisions I should escalate. The other one is if I escalate a decision, why it will take a very long time as opposed to making that decision locally. And the third aspect, which is probably the worst, is that typically the people at the top, the farther away you go from the field, the least amount of information you have. And so what that means is that you tend to make decisions based on low quality information, and that typically yields low quality decisions. So how can you revert this right, for speed and effectiveness? Well, you decentralize, and basically, you give people a lot of context, and we'll get there out in a minute. And so yeah. they can make really good decisions that do what's best for the team and the company because you put them in a situation where they know how to, right? And then you don't make decisions. They make decisions. As in, if they ask for, you know, if you're a manager and people ask you for your opinion, you might give it to them, but they're not bound to follow it. It's just a chat, right? And so in order for this to work, you need to give teams a lot of autonomy. So the teams need to be able to do mistakes because if there's no psychological safety, none of this will ever work. You can't tell people, hey, you do whatever you want, but if you do wrong, according to me, I will fire you. Well, ain't going to work that well, right? And so on top of that, you need to align people, right? Because the centralized control without alignment is chaos, right? People just go in 10,000 different directions. People need to understand what is the technical strategy, why certain decisions might make more sense or less sense, you know, why are we even doing this in the first place? So it's a lot of effort. You need to involve the team from the beginning rather than just telling them, hey, you need to add this field to this database. They don't even know why, right? And then the third thing is you need to support people, right? So if the team's need to, I don't know, change some architectural decision that might have some consequences. You want a network of experts that is there to support them. But the important thing is that this network of experts should act as a consultant and an advisor, not as a gatekeeper or decision maker. So as an example, if there's an architectural guild or an architectural group, the way it should work is that if the teams need something, some knowledge or advice in terms of architecture, this group should be there ready to support them, both with words and with, I don't know, actual work. But the difference is that the teams should remain in control of the final decision, not like, oh, they need to delegate authority to this group or get approvals or anything like that, right? Mm -hmm. that, that, that's a good explanation now. Um, and it's nice how you also linked it to the whole military because many people the reason why they're using command and control is because uh, it's the way it was once upon a time in the military but now not even the military uses it uh because there's a difference between okay making us a, a strategy and everyone needs to be aligned regarding the goal and strategy but when they're on the ground and should someone move left or right well it depends on is there a rock next to you is it mm -hmm. raining and if you have to call up your 
you know, the chief, every time that there's rain or there's a rock yeah. in front of you, well, then it's going to be uh, very slow and pretty much um, that uh, so uh, the war is lost in, in, in that case. Uh, now, in terms of companies, what if someone says, but the manager is someone who is more senior, more smarter, they will make, for example, smarter decisions. In that case, uh, someone might say, well, why should we give the team, you know, autonomy? Wouldn't it be better for the smart manager to make all, all the decisions? Maybe if you could explain that as well. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a few things to say here, right? And, and we can talk about teamwork later on. So in general, you know, a competent team will literally destroy a smart person in terms of decision making. Here is a, is a matter of if you bring six, seven competent people and they mm -hmm. together spend time coming up with a decision, that decision is usually immensely higher quality than if a single person that makes that decision in general. Now, obviously, there are exceptions, you know, fair enough. Now, the other aspect is that in general, the team have a lot more bandwidth to think about the problem and the solution. So typically, managers are busy with management, hopefully, or with approving holidays in the worst case. And then the point is, you have, I don't know, an hour to make a decision while a team would have a week to think about it or a day to think about it. So that's a different aspect. The, the last thing is, in that case, you know, the team can still ask the manager and so on, but this is not like a... A control problem is a training problem. So you would have that manager transfer their smarts and help the team and coach them until they pick up this thing, right? So it's not that, you know, it's not that we don't want that manager to decide, you know, and still like coach with the team and, you know, come up with a decision and influence it. It's that it shouldn't be their primary job. They should be busy designing and evolving processes and teams and so on. <laughs> Yeah, um, uh, exactly. Like I, I think that a really great argument that you brought in there, which invalidates, you know, uh, I guess many objections that people have, is the whole statement that in most situations, at least for enterprise development, so here we're not talking about like the theory of relativity or so, so something at that level, but for most work, that actually the quality of solution from a team would far outweigh even if we pick someone who's like really really smart person but actually the output from the team okay. would be a, a lot higher um now regarding uh, psychological safety which is okay easier said than done uh how do we actually build psychological safety well i mean psychological safety it's not even something that you build, right? It's an emergent property. And basically, you just need to allow people to fail. I mean, it sounds easy, and you know, it's easier said than done, of course. But the, the entire point is here, if a team is going down a path that, assuming that, I don't know, we know that that path is going to fail, right? Now, here we got two options. Either we tell that team, hey, don't do that because you're going to fail. So do this other thing instead. Or we tell them, hey, you know, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? But if they still want to continue, you let them continue until they figure out that maybe it wasn't the best idea. And why is this important? Well, because this way you develop the team as a side effect, right? And so now you got a smarter team which understands, well, first of all, that sometimes what you say might be right. And the second thing is, you know, they understand that that thing doesn't work. Now, you should only get worried when the teams do the same mistake multiple times, right? So, you know, you learn something, it's great. Now, if you fail and you should have learned this thing already, then it's a little bit like a different problem. But the point is, psychological safety is super important because, you know, the best idea at the end of the day need to win. So here it's not about who's saying what, it's doing what's best for the company. Right. And so your point is going back to the super smart manager, right? If yes. I have a super smart manager, well, there might be circumstances in which case they're wrong. And, you know, if you don't create psychological safety and the team needs to feel like saying, no, sorry, we don't do going to do this. We're going to do something else instead because you're wrong. Well, in that case, you will actually feel the consequences of this model. Right. You know, once again, yeah. it takes a lot of effort. 
you know, it's really, really hard. When you see somebody doing something wrong, it's really hard not to jump in and help or, you know, tell them. But yeah, that, that's what it's about. Yes, because in the end, the only way that the person can is, well, they have to go through failures. Because actually, the failure, it's actually an opportunity for learning. And if someone just um, spoon feeds someone with uh, answers, then uh, people will just have very su superficial uh knowledge but here we actually allow them to learn much faster and to remember what they learned yeah. uh now regarding i guess uh, various processes within companies like interviewing you know performance manager management firing mm -hmm. and incentives uh how, how should that be done i mean a common thing which companies are doing are saying for example okay we will now optimize recruitment like optimize interviewing or optimize okay should companies locally you know optimize or should there be some kind of systems in here yeah i mean the i think like we should have a brief brief chat around people teams and processes right and you know at the end of the day once again is a view of the world right and and to me it boils down once again to efficiency and effectiveness Right, I'll get, I'll answer processes last, right? So, I mean, the first thing is trying to understand how people work and how teams work, right? Because processes are an extension in this case. But as an example, in terms of people, you know, there's, I can't remember if it was Daniel Pink or somebody else, but basically they came up with this idea that, you know, for a person to stay engaged and thrive in a company and not get frustrated and leave, they need to have autonomy, mastery and purpose, right? I would actually add fun. I don't think that autonomy, mastery, and purpose are enough. I think you also have to have fun at work. And, you know, the, the other aspect is people are not machines. So once again, this is important to, to underline, right? They got emotions. They're part of teams. Teams create like a tribal feeling, right? And so, you know, when people expect everybody to behave like a machine, they're going to get big surprises. And even you know, saying something in an announcement in a wrong way can create ripple effects that will destroy or promote performance company-wide for months, right? And so the whole point is understanding people, you know, understanding a reciprocity principle, which is something that a lot of companies forget, but, you know, fundamentally boils down to if you treat people really, really well, they will treat you as the company really, really well. And if you don't, well, they won't. Right. And so this one is a, so as an example, if you treat everybody like uh, some untrustworthy, incompetent people, you will end up with a bunch of untrustworthy, incompetent people. That's exactly how it works. Right. And, and you know, then we move into teamwork. So, you know, a lot of companies, they love filling their mouth with the teamwork words. Right? And they're like, oh, there's teams and we're a team. And in most cases, they don't actually work as a team. So as an example, if you take the average Scrum team, team, once again, it's the wrong word, but if you take the average Scrum bunch, the way they work is they pull or get pushed work from this backlog. And then, you know, they split the work into individual tasks, disappear for a bit, yeah, with stand-ups and whatnot, and then basically come back and put the work back together, right? But this is not how team work. So as an example, if you take, I don't know, a basketball team, or if you take a military team, they don't like, oh, I don't know, if we're assaulting a military base, it's not like each member of the team do their own thing in isolation, then they come back. It makes no sense, right? So, you know, the, the, this idea that there is the individual contributor, it doesn't even make sense. You know, people love talking about individual contributors as well, but in software product development, it makes no sense. So if you, if you take a bunch of people who clean the streets, Right? People who clean the streets, they actually split the work, right? So they arrive in the morning, get coffee together, decide which areas of the street they clean up, and then, you know, have a hard all at the end of the day and go home. And they call themselves a team, perhaps, but they're not a team, right? And so which part is missing and why do street cleaners work like this, right? So the part that's missing is that in, in a bunch of people that work towards the same goal is not enough to be called a team. Those people need to work together towards the same goal. And so what together means is that they have to pick up each other's luck and help each other and figure out together the whole thing. 
right? So as an example, if you take even football, which has very specialized roles, it's not like, I don't know, if the ball is in the first half of the pitch, I don't know, Lionel and Messi just watching the game or having a cigarette, right? It's not how it works. They all work together in all phases, right? If you take basketball, military teams, it's always the case. Now, for software development, unfortunately, most companies, it's not the case. They work like street cleaners. Pick up a task, do my own thing in isolation, and then come back and do it again. There is no joining knowledge and effort into a collective effort to solve the problem together, right? And so why all these, these distinctions, right? Well, it's because when you go to interviewing and performance management, firing and incentives, well, it depends on which view of the world you got. So as an example, let's talk about performance management, right? Now, if we're saying that we're all about teamwork and the unit of work allocation is the team, then why do we do individual performance management? It makes no sense. Once again, it's not the performance of the parts, it's the interactions that will make the performance. So if a person joins a company as a software engineer, 90 to 95% of his performance in terms of outcomes and outputs, even outputs, doesn't depend on the person. It depends on the company, on the pipelines, on the processes, and on the team. And if this is true, and it's clearly true, true I mean, it's very, very easy to understand, right? So I'll, I'll give you a brief example. You can be the fastest and most amazing developer in the world. If you need to do a pull request, and it takes five days to get an approval. Well, your performance will be very different compared to if you work on trunk, very different. And it's not up to you, it's up to the process around you and the team around you, right? And once, or if I make you work with a computer which is super slow, well, your performance will be super slow. There's not much you can do about it, right? Yes. And so, and so what is the point of doing individual performance management? It makes no sense. You're doing a lot of stuff that is actually damaging, right? Because you're optimizing the parts rather than the whole. And if you're talking about firing, well, you don't fire. So, you know, even interviewing, let's talk about interviewing first. If you believe in the individual contributor, then the way a lot of companies interview is they interview for lack of weakness, right? So they do several rounds. In each round, they screen for weakness. The moment they identify weakness, you're out of the process, right? Well, what's the problem with that? Well, is that, you know, and this is the same for bugs and problem solving, right? Is that when something doesn't work like a bug, right? So usually removing the bug is not enough. So when you want to evolve the, the effectiveness of something, you need to redesign it. So it's not enough to not want something. You need to actually figure out what you want. And so as an example, if I'm saying hey, I need to uh, hire an engineer without weaknesses, that's not usually a good thing. You want somebody which has deep strengths and weaknesses, and you want to bundle them together by carefully designing the teams so that you put people in those teams with, you know, strengths that complement each other and weaknesses that can, you know, be smoothed out by the strengths of other team members, right? And so if you think like that, it doesn't make sense to, cast somebody out of an interview process if they're weak at something. What you care about is what they're strong at. So very different mindset, right? And so for firing, it's the same case. I don't fire somebody if they don't know databases. Who cares? I just put them in a team where they know databases, so that's okay, right? And, and when it comes to incentives, which is fundamental, you can talk about whatever you want, psychological safety, team or whatever. If you reward the wrong behaviors, or punish the good behaviors, people will notice. You know, at the end of the day, everybody's self-serving. I am, most people are, well, all people are. You know, you're there to do what's best for you. And so if what's best for you is not what's best for the team and is not what's best for the company, guess what people will do, what's best for them. So as an example, yes. we can talk about coaching each other. And, you know, oh, yes, if I'm really good at, I don't know, Java, I can teach you Java as another developer. But the point is, if at the end of the year, I get my bonus based on the fact that I know Java better than you do, well, guess what? I won't teach it to you. I will talk about doing it, but I won't do it, right? Yeah, exactly. I think that this is this was a really good uh, overview. I mean, starting with the whole point that uh, a key essence of 
a team is uh, it's not just about working towards the same goal but about working together so um, a good analogy is uh, a sports team they are constantly on the field uh, work even though one of them has the ball for example but they're actually all working together no one is si sitting uh, mm -hmm. on the uh, bench and that kind of Pers um, perspective, knowing that they will all uh, learn together and they all have different strengths, but th that all their strengths are combined that then later fits in with what you explained about uh, recruiting like for strengths, because if we actually, if they are working together, then result at any point should be uh, at least the sum of all the individual strengths and, and mm -hmm. even more. So we actually want to then optimize for having uh, uh, strengths in various aspects so that we get, how shall I say, some mega, uh, it's like a, that kind of person doesn't exist, but the team can collectively exhibit those uh, properties. So that, that was a really good um, overview. And uh, you mentioned uh, the whole impact uh, about even if we have a great developer, but if they're working on, you know, in a pull request and have to wait for five days, that obviously they will have a lower like outputs and outcomes compared to a developer who is working trunk based development and don't have to wait for pull requests. So maybe you could uh, explain a bit more about uh, the whole topic of uh, feedback loops, cost of delay, uh, work in progress, cost of inventory, and how all yeah. this fits in with mob programming, test-driven development, trunk-based, continuous integration, and uh, continuous delivery. Right. Yeah, I mean, small topic. Let's try it. So, <laughs> yes, a long topic. <laughs> so, I mean, the... I mean, once again, right, it boils down to how you see this, this job, right? And, and the point is... There's a lot of analogies, especially in lean, between manufacturing and software product development. And those analogies are misleading because it's easy to think about, you know, the digital factory, right? So all the large banks, you know, we're all talking about this digital factory. But in a nutshell, software product development is really different from manufacturing, right? And and why? And and how I'll get to those things in a minute. So it's very yeah. different because in manufacturing, the whole point is you go unit economics. So the way it works is you build, I don't know, something, spend some time to prototype it, like R&D, and then you sell millions of it, sometimes tens of millions, and you make money for each piece you sell, okay? And the other difference is that in manufacturing, when you, I don't know, deliver low quality, you can lose reputation and, you know, some money, but that's about it. Now, in software engineers, it will be different, especially if you work in SaaS. You typically are continuously evolving the same one product or small set of products, and people pay an ongoing subscription for it, right? And so what does it mean? Well, what it means is that the amount of profit and revenue you get doesn't depend on how many products you sell. Right, because it, it only depends on how many customers you can keep happy and for how long. Right. And so as an example, this is very different because what it means is that those products are continuously evolved and redesigned. It's not like in manufacturing where once you fix something, you will produce it massively, pretty much unchanged. Right. And so in manufacturing, there's efficiency considerations and you need to cut costs aggressively and so on. Right. And and in software product delivery, it's a little bit different because most of the work is exploratory. You have no idea how to make customers happy most of the times. You need to figure out how to keep them happy. And it's not quantity, it's quality. So it doesn't matter how many features you ship, how many things you do. What matters is, are you solving their problem? Are you meeting their needs? And those needs evolve, and so you always need to evolve your product, right? And or set of products. And so why does this matter? Because in manufacturing, feedback loops after the products left the factory, it's not that important. I mean, it is important, but not as, in, as it is in software product delivery. Now, in software product delivery, it's absolutely fundamental because you're exploring. And so the longer you keep your eyes closed, the more danger it becomes, right? And so what does it mean? Well, what it means is that all these agile practices, like, you know, continuous delivery, continuous integration, trunk-based development, TD, 
mob programming and so on to an extent they are there working as a system so once again they compound together to make your whole software delivery process better or worse right and and the way they work is they work because they reduce feedback loop and as such anything that has a cost of delay like most things will be better served by these approaches so as an example if i don't know what our customers want of course i want to go towards an environment where i deliver much quicker something much smaller to figure out whether i'm on the right path or not i mean it would be insane not to what do i want to do? spend three years building something and then figure out that it's not needed i mean that would be catastrophic and if i'm working with tdd the whole point is Apart from the fact that, you know, there's, there's a lot of other benefits about like getting the right level of abstraction, design from a consumer's point of view. But the whole point is if I'm building something, I can press a button while I'm building something. And it tells me immediately in second or so whether everything works according to my understanding or not. Of course, I go much faster. It's a safety net, right? So if I need to build something, I'm like, hey, I'm changing something. Does it still work? Oh, it still works. Well, that's a really good thing to have. Rather than I might get in entire situations where I don't know if what I got works or not for hours. And why does it work well with continuous integration trunk-based development? If every time a test is green, I push. Well, worst case, I can revert after five minutes and I lose five minutes. If I push, you know, or commit every forever, well, this this benefit is not there. And and you know, if every time I push to trunk rather than to my own branch. This is integrated and tested. I get other feedback. You know, my team can see that, you know, or the other sub mob in our case can see that and they can give me early feedback. So, hey, you created this interface. I was about to do the same. Why don't we join forces? And otherwise, you would have to wait until you merge your branch into Trunk to, to have the same benefit, right? And that's, that's yes. pretty much about it. I guess it's all linked to cost because in these cases where we are uh, exploring, then the shorter feedback loops actually help us move in the right direction versus moving in the wrong direction yeah. efficiently. So to, to move in the right direction and we're also uh, optimizing, like we're minimizing costs at, yeah. at every um, uh, single point. And as an example, uh, if you do mob programming on trunk and you don't need pull requests and why don't you need them because actually you get a pull request reviewed by three four other people for every character you write so it's extremely well reviewed it's just not done after a week it's done after every second or two and so it's, it's much higher quality right and if a part of these experts disagree with the technical approach, you get that feedback immediately, not after you spend a week going in potentially wrong direction. Right? Yes, it's then uh, uh, cheaper to give feedback and actually people are incentivized to actually give uh, yeah. feedback versus knowing that someone had already worked on something for five days and knowing that your feedback will now make them rework everything and that maybe someone in management might say, why are you now spending 10 days on something which was already done? Uh, yeah. So yeah, that, that's, these are definitely, I guess, good, good arguments. And uh, now moving on to also uh, architecture. So mm -hmm. like hexagonal architecture, event-driven, service choreography and CQRS. Mm -hmm. um, how does uh, that fit in into this bigger picture? Yeah, I mean, in a similar way, right, all these architectural patterns are still related to each other. And at the end of the day, the point is, you know, in software, most approaches work. It's usually about trade-offs, right? And in particular, if you're very careful with architecture, like evolving it towards a share nothing architecture and stuff like that, right? Event driven is very pure, as in the only contract with choreography is the actual events, right? Mm -hmm. So just yes. to recap, choreography, the idea is that is the centralized logic. So I don't tell other services what to do or when to do it. Actually, as a microservice, I'm not even aware about other microservices. All I know is that I can receive some events and I can produce events telling the entire ecosystem what just happened on my side, right? And so there's never uh, synchronous requests, there's never asynchronous commands, there's no databases shared and so on. And why is it great? Well. If, if you build things like that, the whole point is that it reduces the cognitive load 
when it comes to, as an example, maintaining one of these microservices. Because now I know that by working this way, I cut out entire branches of reality that are not possible anymore. So if I produce an event, which is the same schema using Avro or Protobuf or whatnot, of the event I used to produce a second ago, I have the mathematical guarantee that I cannot break a downstream service. And this is amazing because it means I don't have to worry about it. I can go much faster. I can test the performance of my components in isolation, right? And so on. So by decoupling things, I remove some circumstances which I would have to worry about if I didn't. So hexagonal architecture is not a bright, bright example of this. If I separate things very carefully with modularity, now the point is if now through a port, I get, a, I don't know, a different port and adapter input to my service, I'll need to retest my driven adapter. I don't need to retest my application logic. It makes no sense. It's simply impossible for that thing to break these other things, which means I don't need to retest them, which means that my build pipelines, if they do hashing correctly, will be faster. And so on, so on, so on. Once again, they play together, all these concepts, right? And so if I use domain-driven design and I create an age type, which is self-validating through solid principles, and I say, I don't know, that every time I receive an age uh, less than zero, it throws an error at construction level. Now, suddenly, everywhere I use this age type, I don't need to worry, hey, is this age less than zero? And, and all these things together really reduce the accidental complexity of what you're doing. Yes, and I think that now this actually sounds very similar to the previous talks about uh, systems within organizations in the same way that we mentioned the whole benefit of decentralized uh, uh, decision making. Um, I guess similar principles apply to architecture as well, because, for example, as you explained, service co co uh, choreography, it's essentially like decentralized decision making. We have a big system, but instead of one big brain or one big service knowing er or everything or deciding everything, it's split and then each one works as like a team. But here, okay, it's a so yeah. software system. Uh, and uh, so it reduces the, the cognitive load and they have contracts between them. So as long as they satisfy the contract, they can be safe knowing that they haven't broken the system. So we can keep the system actually in a running state the whole time. Okay, um, so I guess this leads us to the last part of our um, discussion, which is the deep dive into how to test and build a microservice with um, test-driven development. Maybe, firstly, you could give us some intro regarding, I guess, automated testing, test-driven development, and the various uh, types of tests. And then maybe we could illustrate this with some also practical example of like making an order and canceling an order. Yeah, yeah, let's, let's structure the, the whole discussion this way. Uh, so like, let's say for, for practical examples that like you got like, I don't know, an e-commerce system, right? And you need to write this microservice. I mean, obviously it's simplified, right? But as an idea, you need to write this microservice where you need to post an order, right? And, and then you need to get orders out, right? And or, or let's keep it even simpler. Let's imagine you need to edit an order. So it's a simple put. So it's probably easier, right? So there's a REST API put, I don't know, orders, ID, and whatnot. And then basically the idea is you can change fields and status of the order, right? And this needs to publish some information to an evident propagation framework, Perl, Sarkafka, and whatnot, right? And it needs to then reply back to the API saying, hey, I accepted this thing, which is now fine, right? So how, how would you structure this and, you know, what would you want to do when creating this thing, right? So, I mean, in terms of testing, I mean, I'm a big fan of TDD and acceptance, TDD and so on. The, the whole point is why we're doing this thing, right? And, and, you know, what does it add? Well, in general, the whole idea is, uh, I tend to use hexagonal architecture for the microservices I write, and we can talk about testing and test strategy in a sec. But basically, the whole point with TDD is you focus on the contracts, right? So no, there's a lot of people talking about unit tests, right? And there's this idea that for each class you write, you also create that class test and so on, right? And, and I kind of really disagree. And, and one of the problems with this is that it makes your tests 
really pretty tall because basically it couples your test to the structure rather than to the behavior. So if I have like, a, a, I don't know, a contract for a library or whatever, my application that says that given this input and given this state, I got an output and some side effects, this is what I should test against, right? And so I shouldn't be testing the internals because what that means is that every time I change these internals, then I would have to redo a large number of tests, which basically will hinder me and prevent me from refactoring effectively. Right? And so as an example, in this case for hexagonal architecture, the whole point is you would start by writing a system test or what I call a system test. And a system test typically works like this, right? You will spin up all your dependencies within the test. So you can do this with, I don't know, if you work on the JVM or I think it works even in JS or whatever with test containers. Right? And so in this case, I would spin up my, I don't know, Kafka, uh, Docker image, right? And the whole idea is that then I would spin up my entire microservice as part of this test, including the endpoint, right? And I would pass the Kafka properties to the microservice so that it creates a connection against Kafka, right? And so what you want to start doing is you want to create a test where you send an HTTP request in, the real HTTP request using a real HTTP client. And then as an example, how would you know if this HTTP request is compliant with what you accept as part of the contract, right? So I don't know, people use Swagger, so you could potentially write a Swagger file with JSON schema definitions and so on, and you can validate that your HTTP request complies with that Swagger definition. So query params, headers, whatnot, right? And so you create an order as a domain type, you convert that order into an HTTP request, then you send each, you check that the HTTP request complies with the Swagger or whatever contract form you use. You send the HTTP request through, and what you do is now I'm actually monitoring for side effects my actual downstream dependencies, Kafka in this case, with an actual Kafka consumer that I spin up as part of the test. And so when the response comes out in terms of HTTP, I want to test that the response has the right status code, it complies with the Swagger definition for the response. I parse the data out and I check that it matches what I told it based on state and input and so on. And then I also check that my side effects, in this case, producing an event to Kafka is honored, right? So I wait until I receive the event or I time out, I parse the event out using the Avro schema that I expect and I check that the data is all matching, right? And so in general, this is a very powerful test. So it sounds very slow, but typically this container on M1 would start Kafka in about a couple of seconds. It's actually not that slow. And so you end up with a very covering test, you know, a very real test that takes a couple of seconds. And then on top of it, you want another couple of system tests, typically checking that as an example, if Kafka is not running, can my application start or will it crash or if a request arrives and I cannot talk to Kafka, but then midway I can, and anyway, it's, it's actually quite cool. You can use Docker pose and unpose for it. Will my request still go through, right? Will it recover eventually? And then after you got yeah. this, you... sorry, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to uh, maybe uh, explain a few, few points, which I think were really important points that you mentioned. So first of all, the misconception that people have regarding um, you know, uh, that a test is for every class and test per method. Uh, I do want to like pause on that point for one minute because that came up in, I think, nearly every meetup and people are constantly asking that same question. Uh, Uncle Bob had also written uh, an article that uh, in 2001 or something, when he first started with fitness, he was actually writing a test uh, per uh, class, but then later saw during the years all these problems with brittleness because those kind of tests prevent you from uh, refactoring between classes. So if you want to move a method or apply design patterns, okay, you've got and really brittle tests and those classes are actually a particular decision of a structure. Later you can decide to restructure instead of mm -hmm. five classes, maybe you will have 10 classes or three classes, which you change the interaction, but you're not, not changing the uh, behavior, yeah. whereas if you couple the tests to 
behavior, like what's the behavior, you know, of the library or something like that, then then the test would be much more robust. So I think that 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 was an excellent point that you brought up because this then also makes hexagonal architecture have more sense. Uh, uh, it actually it's about yeah exposing uh, the application behavior when we're targeting you know uh, the the hexagon. The other also interesting thing which I found was how you mentioned starting with um, like that system test, which is essentially like a skeleton system test in a way you want, okay, to start up the real microservice and all its real, real dependencies. That was also interesting how you brought up because some people, they firstly start off with maybe testing business logic and then later mm -hmm. actually do the system test. Could you maybe explain why you start with a system yeah. test at the beginning versus later? Yeah, to be honest, I mean, I sometimes do the opposite as well. So I mean, whether it's outside in or inside out, I actually like both. I'm a bit whimsical when it comes to it. So the thing is, I can see both benefits, right? And, and I like to mix and match. So in terms of like starting with a system test, well, the power is, first of all, you know when you're done. And mm -hmm. the point is you end up building a domain and an application which are a better fit for what you actually need for that specific service, right? So typically, sometimes when you start with application and domain, you create something quite generic, which you might not necessarily need for this specific use case, right? But then, you know, if you start with the system test, it really forces you to think about the inbound and outbound contracts. So what is my API? I need to define Swagger. I need to define payload. Okay, fair enough, right? And so typically, it's a bit of all. So typically, I sketch this thing knowing that it won't be perfect. And then what I start to do is I go as an example from domain and application and I TDD them inside out where I start. It's still outside in as in from the contract of what the application, the domain will do. But then the point is in terms of hexagonal, like, you know, you come from the center and go outwards, right? And so the whole idea is after you create a domain and an application layer, which you can TDD and those tests are blazing fast and they're quite covering and so on. Then you start integrating your application into an endpoint. And at that point, you test that driving adapter. And by injecting a mocked or stub version of that application layer line. Like, so there you can go for different corner cases. Oh, by if I pass this field, do I handle the error correctly? All things that in a system test it would be too slow and tedious to actually test, right? And so for the driven adapters, you do the same. So you create an abstraction that talks to Kafka. In this case, it would be like a publisher abstraction. And you check against test containers that I can actually publish with all sorts of different things. Does my, I don't know, SSL work or anything like that, right? So I, I do use both. I see benefits in both. I think typically what I tend to do is I create myself this big feedback loop, and I create smaller feedback loops inside until it all works together. Uh, yes, and I guess uh, it also helps um, because we're focusing on, I guess, big picture thinking rather mm -hmm. than getting lost in the detail. Um, it helps the whole team know whether they have some blocker infrastructure mm -hmm. problem instead of discovering that there's like a firewall or some other yeah. problem on like on the last day or the day before the pr production. Uh, and it's like, okay, let's get the minimalist uh, walking skeleton and, and then uh, zooming in uh, inside. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, you did mention, okay, we are testing the adapters where we can maybe, you know, test some corner cases in terms of how we can integrate. But could you explain a bit more how you test um, inside the hexagon since uh, there's, I guess, multiple perspectives? Uh, some people might test through... Uh, use cases, so testing at the boundary of the hexagon, mm -hmm. testing use case behavior. Other people might start with the main entities and later test use cases or something. So if you could elaborate a bit more on your approach. Yeah. In that. Yeah, 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 sure. So, I mean, typically what I do is I do this, right? So I start from the domain after I'm done with the system test. And mm -hmm. by domain, I don't mean specific types. I mean, I structure what I call example tests, which are the side effect of my TDD activity. And I start sketching out the collaboration between the domain types. So as an example, in this case, there's going to be probably like an order. There's going to be probably like, I don't know, a shop. There's going to be a customer. And so as an example, I'm going to start sketching out, hey, as a test, there's a customer. 
and this customer now wants to edit its order against the shop, right? And how's that gonna work out in terms of like sync and async and you know the whole thing, right? And then I'm starting to sketch cases where I mock my dependencies or stop them. And given this, how will the domain interact? I put most of my business logic in the domain. So my application layer is typically very, very shallow, right? Mm -hmm. And so after this is all there, these tests, once again, they're not one assert per test. This is another thing I'm not a fan of. Actually, they're very covering and deep, right? And so here, a test is quite involved and there are different collaborators, which are actual collaborators, not just mock dependencies. And what happens if that test pass, you got a sense that your domain is working well. It's not like something that would be fooled by a different kind of mock or anything like that, right? And the cool thing about it is that these example tests, they're written in a way that is understandable in terms of the domain. So if, I don't know, in the case of an order for, a, I don't know, shopping experience, if for e-commerce, if a product owner or the, pro the, the owner of the company were to read the test, is written in a way where it makes sense. It talks about customers modifying order. It's not something like order service dot accept uh, and it has user ID or anything else, right? And then after this part is done, typically I build my application layer, which removes the complexity of orchestrating the domain types from the driving adapters. And this is particularly important if you have more than one driving adapter. So as an example, imagine in order to fulfill this, I need to hydrate a proxy of a customer. And this proxy has a, I don't know, a function, which is called modify order. And it takes an order value object or a reference and so on, right? The point is that there's a knowledge in understanding how to orchestrate those types. And so you don't want to repeat yourself for every driving adapters, right? So you do this and then basically, it, this facade allows you to test the driving adapters by mocking directly this facade. Mm -hmm. So I, I just to check regarding mocking, mm -hmm. uh, are you mocking at the architectural boundary, which means, for example, mocking repository, mocking external mm -hmm. services, or do you mock all classes inside anything that a class collaborates oh, with? No, 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 definitely, definitely at the boundary. So what I do is, okay. so when I test the domain, I mock the, the ports, basically, the contracts, right? Yes, yeah, so the, the the driven ports. So yeah, okay, great. Uh, I mean, I, I do basically a similar thing. And again, that's a consequence of also hexagonal architecture. Um, so I guess we discussed uh, a various set of topics. Uh, I guess we could now also move on to the uh, Q&A. So I will be now just showing some questions which came up. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, the first question. So this is all really intuitive and makes sense. Um, my manager is using a more mission control perspective with autonomy, but there are lots of pieces on his mission left undone. How do you fix that? So I guess like it depends what it means. Right? And then Brandy, if you're still there, I mean, or feel, feel free to comment, right? But the whole point is, it depends. So it, it depends how you articulate the mission. In, in a lot of cases, it depends on the granularity of the mission. So as an example, a lot of teams that use Scrum, they go and they find a Scrum goal, sprint goal, right? And then the point is that like, hey, but we often do not deliver all the stories in this in the sprint goal, right? And that's the wrong kind of mission. So as an example, in Scrum, and you know, I'm not a fan of Scrum, and I don't even know why I'm talking about it, but just as an example. But the point is that a lot of people misunderstand it, right? And so as an example, in Scrum, the sprint goal is a direction. So you say something like, hey, our, I don't know, imagine that you are a content uh, platform that allows teachers to run courses. You're like, hey, this sprint, we're going to focus on making the, the experience for teachers that want to create content better. Because we see from our metrics that not many teachers create a second course after they created their first course. And so we want to help them because we feel that this is going to improve our thing. So in this case, there is no way there's a missing piece. This is a goal, and you work in that direction. You might achieve a percentage or another percentage, but it's not a bag of things you need to get done, right? And so go, going back to, to your question, the point is probably the granularity of this mission is a little bit too detailed. It sounds like a bag of things to do, so you can leave 
some pieces undone, right? Another aspect is who decides, you know, when people say, hey, you need to do these five things in the next two weeks. Okay, cool. But, you know, there might be another possibility, which is it might not even be possible. You know, in a lot of cases, people are like, oh, we want this done by next quarter. I'm like, yeah, well, fair enough, guys, but this is not Harry Potter. You know, as we work through, we might discover this is possible. And maybe it takes a week rather than a quarter. Or maybe we'll take three quarters, or maybe we'll take never. Because maybe it's like nonsensical and, and it's not achievable at all, right? And so in general, the whole point is you want to structure the goals for the teams or the mission in a way that is a, a direction, not a list of checkpoints to go. Uh, yes, because uh, I guess the whole topic of the there's, for example, pieces undone, it implies that there was an original full list of tasks mm. to do. And in that case, then, then someone goes into measuring, okay, we had uh, 100 tasks, so okay, uh, 80 were done, 20 were, were not done. But if someone is actually mm. maybe moving in a sense of having a goal and a uh, direction, we, we don't have that list of tasks, but rather we're maybe working on the most valuable to reach that and just seeing where we are in alignment with the goal, but we don't actually have uh, a list of you know what's done and what's not. Um, okay. The next one, that was a good question. Uh, how do you go about enforcing mob or pair programming when working for a startup where you're a solo developer, maybe doing back-end, front-end, mobile? I mean, if what do you mean? If you're a solo developer... Doing... If you're working by yourself, so does this mean, okay, well, if someone's working by themselves, then it, is it even possible or is it like first there has to be a team before you can apply? No, no, I mean, these things like, you know, people take them as, oh my God, we need to work together, all together, all the time. But it's really not, right? So first of all, I wouldn't go at enforcing anything. I mean, as a general practice, right? The whole point is you can, first of all, give luck to the teams so that they might self-organize. And the whole, the whole idea is you structure incentives and the conversation around, hey guys, you need to achieve this as a team. You know, this is your mission and this is how it fits within the company and what we want to do and why it's important. And you get the support and the time to do it right. Don't rush things, don't work independently. You will not get individual bonuses or pats on the back. Just help each other, learn from each other, and figure it out together. And then, obviously, you know, I might also say, and by the way, you know, there's this thing called ensemble programming, and if you want to know more about it, we're here to support you so that you can learn about it. But it's not like, oh, my God, you jump in and be like, guys, you need to stop whatever you're doing, work this way or else. Right? So, yeah, I hope that, that covers it. Yeah, so I guess the whole point is we can't uh, enforce um, anything uh, um, at all. Mm -hmm. But, but instead present as, as a possible idea? Well, uh, it's, a, it's an interesting one, this one, right? So the point is, to, to an extent, yes. On the other hand, the problem is these things have dramatic performance consequences at team level. So the point is, initially, you want to encourage people to learn and take time, right? But the, the, the big problem is, in a lot of cases, there's a bunch of people who are used to working independently, and they just reject the idea that they might want to work together at any point. And so, you know, in some cases, you might want to intervene because, once again, these things have a serious consequence on, on the team performance. Mm -hmm. Okay, that, that was a good addition. Uh, moving on to the next one. Uh, if you have low coverage, is it wise, in your opinion, to apply TDD when changing or mm -hmm. adding new stuff in existing services? Or having this kind of technical debt made, makes it too late to start with TDD? I think m many people will have a similar question. Yeah, yeah, I'm actually glad this question popped up and I feel a bit silly for not mentioning myself, right? There's, there's a couple of things here to talk about. One is coverage and one is the whole purpose of having tests, right? And uh, so, you know, the coverage is an indicator or at least it really should be. Right? It's not a goal like any indicator, right? And so as an example, what is coverage useful for? Well, you as a team, might want to say, hey guys, out of curiosity, what's our coverage? And if it turns out that your car is like, I don't know, 27%, maybe you should ask a couple of questions. It's not something where you're like, oh my God, our coverage needs to be 85% or, or else, right? Or else we're a bad team, right? 
And it's not really defined. That's an indicator. You might have really high coverage, 100%, and your test suit might be completely useless. So I'll give you a good, good example of that. If you're a JVM developer, try to comment out all your assertions from your tests. And your coverage will stay whatever the coverage is, potentially 100%. And your tests are completely useless. right? And so the point is, coverage is completely separate from TDD. They got really nothing to do with each other. TDD is a great technique. Not so the goal of TDD is not to write tests. That's a side effect, and you know that's a way of helping you achieve the actual goal of TDD, which is to design better code, right, and to go faster while doing that. And, and why does it work like that? Because as you use TDD, you're running code from a consumer's perspective. And so you're running like how a consumer would want to consume it. So that tends to be more consumer oriented, which means that when you actually use it, it's going to be easier and more maintainable. And obviously, you know, the fact that you need to test it means that you're forced to use dependent injection, which increases the coupling. It's all a bunch of really good things. But it's nothing to do with coverage. Coverage, you can achieve high coverage potentially even later. Now, if you use TDD, the fact that your system is more decoupled makes it easier to enhance coverage if you want to, but coverage is not a goal, right? And, and answering to your question, it absolutely changes nothing. As in, you can TDD a class or, you know, a collaboration of types, right? You don't have to, it's not a property of the whole microservice or code base. You is a technique that you use to write software. So you can use it in any project, in any language. It doesn't matter what the project is and what the state of the project is. Is there ever a case when it's not possible? For example, when um, let's say there's a high level of technical debt, and I think maybe that was also hinted in this question. And let's say, for example, dependency injection was mm -hmm. not used and it's a big ball of mud. Is it is it possible to write? Yes, yeah, absolutely. So here there are two things to say. So first of all, dependency injection is a pattern. So you, that's not in preventing you from using it. As in, that's a constructor. It takes an interface as an argument. That's called dependency injection. Nothing to do with frameworks or any of that, right? The other aspect is TDD is a process of writing software in a specific way. So the point is, by definition, something in the past wasn't written with TDD. And so the point is, if you are test for it, it's not now it was written using TDD. It will never be. It's a property of the past, right? It's how you got there that matters, right? And so the whole point is completely unrelated. Now, if the question is, can we transform an existing code base that's a big ball of mud without test into something that has a sound test strategy? Well, potentially, that's a really hard thing, but it's nothing to do with TDD. TDD is a way of using tests to guide your software design. And as long as you can write tests, which hopefully you can write in any project, then the answer is yes, you can use TD. Mm -hmm. I also really liked um, this question because it's really common. And uh, I want to add on an additional point regarding how you mentioned, I mean, coverage is, is not a goal. We don't strive for, for coverage. And someone can also have a high coverage, like 100% coverage, but not assert anything. Um, some useful maybe reading for people is about assertion-free testing. So someone can write tests which uh, trigger code to be executed and mm -hmm. also put try catch blocks everywhere. Those kind of tests will get 100% code coverage and they will never fail, oh, but they will be fully useless. Uh, they're mm -hmm. not asserting behavior at all. Yeah, that's, there's also other really bad examples of this, right? So some examples are when you mock something and then test against the result you instructed the mock to result. I see this, I mean, it sounds surreal, but I actually see it all the time. People be like, hey, I got this function, which is a pass-through and it doesn't do anything interesting. Set my mock to return 12 and check that when I call the function, it returns 12. I'm like, guys, yeah, this is like completely useless. It's not what it's supposed to do, right? And, and the other aspect is, you can write the, the point with tests, right? The point with tests is this. Tests cannot tell you that you're right. Okay, so this is an important thing to understand. Now, tests can tell you that you're wrong. They can tell you that in particular, some of your assumptions that your system was working in a specific way are wrong. But tests cannot reveal bugs. Well, or at least writing an automated test cannot reveal a bug if 
the, the whole point is the process of discovering the bug is separate, right? And so to an example, when people talk about automated tests, right, a lot of questions are, hey, should we just get rid of like manual tester, which is nonsensical. But the point is QA in general is a different activity. So QA is an activity whose job is to figure out problems that we haven't thought about. It's not doing manual regression testing. Yeah, that's dumb. Yeah. We should get rid of it. But here we're talking about things like, hey, so I'll give, give you a small war story, right? When I was working for a company some time ago, I was asked to write a matching engine, right? I build this matching engine. And, you know, matching engines, bids and offers and trading, like you can trade and so on, right? And I built bids and we released bids and it, it worked great, right? And long story short, I, I wrote offers and all my unit tests was passing. I think I had around a thousand tests for this thing, test cases, right? Big coverage, everything working. Despite a little problem, which is I didn't understand how offers actually worked in the domain. And so my implementation was completely wrong. And my automated test suit was validating that my completely wrong implementation was coherent with itself, not that it was good. And so when I spoke with a domain expert, he was like, this is not actually should be behaving. And so I had to change my test and then my implementation to reflect the new state. But no test can tell you that you're right. And so when we go into coverage and all these kind of fancy metrics, we need to keep this in mind, right? So the, the, the test suit is there for the team to have confidence that thing will work. It's not a, like an absolute we need to achieve X percent because otherwise we're bad or anything like that, right? Uh, yeah, so we, we could say that tests are like a safety net for whether um, the yes. uh, system behaves in accordance to our expectations, our, our understanding yes. of behavior, but our understanding could be wrong. And this is why we need uh, exploratory uh, testing and why Q QA is, is not eliminated. Like they should do exploratory testing, but just not manual um uh, qa testing and also one more point regarding test quality uh so we mentioned before about test coverage as not really uh, being a goal in itself or and mm -hmm. not even being a useful measure okay a low coverage number is okay useful measure there's something wrong but a high coverage does not mean high quality but uh, you can also look at uh, mutation testing. Mm -hmm. So whoever is interested in this kind of question, because mutation testing will actually reveal if our tests are, for example, um, missing um, asserts. Mm -hmm. And the other interesting point, how you mentioned um, about, you know, uh, code that was already written without TDD, we, we can't bring TDD into that code. I mean, okay, we can with test plus cover it with tests, but pretty much TDD can be applied then later to, mm. to new features. And even in, in my experience in uh, uh, projects, uh, I, I found it useful to firstly, if a team has never done any automated tests at all, and the code base has zero tests, to firstly uh, achieve some basic, you know, writing tests retroactively so that yeah, people can learn skill sets and then they switch it later. TDD, and that's when that whole thing that you explained about, it's like a mindset approach, uh, um, I guess, um, becomes possible. And we also have another interesting question. Um, mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about burnout, its signs, uh, and how it can be treated? I personally find this a really interesting question because it could also be related to systems level problems yeah, and it actually causes burnout as well yeah um totally i mean there's there's so much to say and you know i'm hardly an expert but the, the my, my feeling is busy this right is that the business in general can have different mindsets right so we talked about the analytical mindset or mechanistic right and that is a systemic or synergistic kind of mindset and and then you know there's mums and pops shops where everybody's just chaotic and so on, right? And, and typically what happens is most businesses start as moms and pop shops, right? And, you know, a startup is a family. That's the metaphor. And we all love each other. And there's no structure. And it's kind of a mess, right? And and then at some point, they be, if, if they're lucky, they become big enough and successful enough where this is not no longer tolerable, right? And so 
tra they transition to this analytical mindset where people the, the, so everything becomes super organized and you have committees for everything and chapters tribes squads and performance reviews and managers of managers and then typically what happens is the view is that the employee is a cog in a machine right they the actual idea is that the company is a factory and your worker or in in terms of like 200 years ago or the the company is a machine and you're a part right and so what that means is that employees are asked to check their soul at the door the expectation is you got no emotions, no personal goals, no ambitions. You know, your machine, pick a task, work on it, check the story points, check the coverage. You know, otherwise you're a bad guy, do a core review, push and do it again. Right. And guess what? It sucks. And people burn out. Right. And why it sucks? Because there's low autonomy. And, you know, like you're at the, the intersection, of what your margin teams, the team lead, the squad lead, the architectural guild master, the, you know. There's a whole kind of thing, and you don't see the value because the work is being decomposed into little parts. And more fundamentally, they rob you. So this way of working robs you of your pride as a craftsman, right? Because your entire point is, if I enjoy doing something, it's because I do it well. And by doing it well, I enjoy it, right? And I want to exercise my skills fully so I get something out of it. Now, if I'm asked to do something which is bad, and I know it's bad deep down or, or high up, the point is I will get frustrated by it, right? Because I won't be learning. I will do something that my brain is telling me not to do. And I'm onto this spinning wheel where I need to do things that are irrelevant. And, you know, I see a lot of frustration because I'm blamed for things that are systemic. So as an example, if people are telling me, hey, why does it take so long? And I spend 25 hours a week in meetings, pointless meetings, and doing a pull request takes a week. Well, that's why it's taking so long. But it's not my fault, right? And so burnout has a huge, you know, like the analytical mindset has a huge effect on this thing, right? And when you go back into systems thinking, the whole point is you need a lot less quantity, a lot higher quality. You give autonomy, cross-functional works to the teams. You ask them to exercise mastery, learn from each other work on the full end-to-end -end goal so understand the whole thing decide together how to tackle it and so on remove most artificial deadlines and you also introduce fun so that thing that i was mentioning right and off the office design and stuff like that and fundamentally you know people are geared up to have fun while they're problem solving or challenge solving in general in a team so that's why things like i don't know uh, playing video games together is fun or why doing crosswords is fun or why playing basketball is fun, mm -hmm. right? And, and work can be the same if it's done in the right way, right? And unfortunately, most companies really don't. Uh -huh. So what you're saying is essentially burnout. It's not a function that someone is just overworking hours, yeah. but uh, they could even be working maybe potentially even just regular full-time hours but yes. due to all the frustrations that it's actually more because yes. due to emotional issues uh, absolutely okay. mm -hmm. yeah yeah definitely because um if someone's having fun then even if they do that activity for a long uh, number of hours they would for example not experience burnout and we also move on to this one. So uh, how does uh, one create the following for specific practices in uh, organization? So will you have some maybe some key people or something who will be advocating for these practices in the organization? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a really good question. And uh, the answer is also really hard to hear. And so that's, that's the reason why most companies don't use these practices, right? And there's, there's a set of reasons. And, you know, there's actually a system of reasons. And, and some, some of the aspects are because these practices are inconvenient. So as an example, when you say that the teams are autonomous and the managers don't make decisions, well, for the existing managers, that's kind of blue. And so the point is, it's hard to transition, right? It's much easier when the company is, is going down the drain because like basically when companies are really desperate, like really, truly, utterly desperate, they try stuff, they throw a lot of money at consultancies and it didn't work. They actually do something that they would never think they would be doing. So as in they actually told to their own people. 
but, but in general, it doesn't happen. So as in, if a company is really not in, in a bad situation, it's really hard for this thing to, to be tried in the first place, right? And then the, the other aspect is that these things are quite hard because basically when you try them, everything you do, right? So people imagine you start doing this thing like it's easy and things are going to automatically go well from day one. And the answer is no, of course not. There's a big learning curve. Things are going to go worse for a while and then hopefully better, right? And, and the whole idea is, in my advice, is typically like create a bubble within the company, so like a specific team, and start working with a coach to show this team what are some possibilities. And don't go and expand this team to other teams. Just keep it there. Let this team pick up, experiment, figure out things, how to integrate with existing processes and people and working out the politics. And after this team is behaving this way, it's much easier because now the other teams will see a team that's having fun, is having like high performance, and I'd be curious, right? And, and when they come and ask, is you letting them in rather than you have to go at their door and be like, hey, guys, you have to change how you need to work because we think that this way is going to be better. Right? And so that's a really big, big difference. People don't like being changed, but they don't mind changing. The, the thing they really hate is if you go there and be like, oh, now you have to change. I think this is a really powerful strategy that, that you uh, mentioned, uh, starting with one team and then coaching that one team, whether it's internal coaching or external yeah. coaching, but essentially uh, uh, coaching, which is completely different to training. The whole point of coaching is, is actually mm -hmm. you, you help people discover themselves and then they can internalize the changes they actually want, wanted and getting something work on a small scale so instead of building a whole committee mm -hmm. of representatives for this practice this practice that okay let's now globally distribute this across the uh, company which is what many companies try to do it's actually better uh, do it well in one small thing get it mm -hmm. stable there and then that team serves as a living example to the rest of the company and then it's no longer some theory that someone is putting forward that yeah. like i don't know trunk based or tdd or uh self-organizing teams it's like it's no longer a nice theory we actually have a living team which is doing it day to day and then that can actually later like just propagate the practice further in a in an organic way the rest of the teams will see the results they will want it and then out of curiosity they want to see okay how did this team achieve it so it's yeah. definitely a good, good motivational strategy for managers it's also much easier right because a lot of people you know the, the problem is this right a lot of people are, have a really hard time when they need to challenge their own assumptions, like everybody, I mean, obviously me too. Right? And the point is, you see something that doesn't click with your beliefs. So as an example, if people are like, or oh, you go to the traditional company, you're like, okay, let's do ensemble programming. We put the whole team on one keyboard. People be like, are you insane? Or you're yes. gonna like slash our efficiency by, I don't know, six times? You're out of your mind. I've never seen it before. You must be wrong, right? And, and the problem is, given that it's exceedingly rare, it's, it's like a, a reinforcing loop, right? And the problem is most companies don't do it, so most managers never get in contact with it. And so the point, if you're like, oh, let's roll this out company-wide, people be like, no, you have to be insane. And, and if you do that, the moment things will start going under, because they will initially, they will shoot you for it, right? And so the whole idea is, okay, let's do a much more sandbox playground and after they see it, then yeah, actually the world is not burning. And actually, you know, as a matter of fact, things might even speed up. That's a separate story, right? Because now they're seeing it, they can experiment with it, ask questions, so everything's much, much smoother. Yeah, definitely. So start small scale and then expand versus starting big scale, which will fail because any learning is actually difficult. Uh, and will in, ultimately fail, which is why many initiatives fail, but instead starting small. Okay, so this, this was really uh, great. I think we covered some excellent um, uh, questions for today and a whole diversity of themes. So great that we managed to get this uh, all in time. Um, I want to say just a really big thank you. Uh, this was a really uh, unique 
session to be able to cover a whole systems level, big picture thinking, like how, how do we actually uh, optimize the whole overall uh, system performance, both through the way that we, you know, give autonomy to teams and uh, the, the way that we restructure the, the system so that managers should focus more about designing systems and interactions and letting the team self-organizing and, and do their best. And the other great thing that we learned today was even if you have the best developer in the world joining the company, but if the practices are suboptimal and if the system is introducing delays, like example, pull, uh, pull, re uh, pull requests versus trunk-based development that even the best developer can't, can't actually perform. And in the end, that what matters is the actual system. So just want to say uh, thanks a lot. It was really great. Um, thanks a lot for sharing all your um, perspectives and in insights. No, I mean, thanks to you again, Valentina. I mean, it was a great shot. I had a lot of fun. And once again, really impressed by what you're doing and, you know, the audience you're getting. And, you know, thanks you guys all as well for, you know, finding the time to show up. And cool, you know, if you if you have any other questions, I feel free to throw at me on LinkedIn or Twitter or whatever. All right. Yes, so we will be having um, links in the description so that you can um, connect or follow uh, Mikhail on LinkedIn uh, uh, and Twitter and similarly also from, from my side. And I want just to finish up um, with tech excellence. So thanks a lot, everyone, for joining us uh, today. And it's great that so many people are actually uh, joining meetups and who want to you know, learn beyond their nine to five job. So uh, as mentioned before, uh, feel free to register on meetup.com um, so that you can get notified about our uh, events. We will be having events twice a week for the next uh, few weeks. After that, we will also have weekly events. So there's going to be a knowledge, like a lot of knowledge sharing. And you can also uh, feel free to like our um, uh, this video and also subscribe to us on uh, YouTube as well as follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter. So thanks a lot, everyone. We really appreciated um, all your um, questions and discussion. And thanks a lot again to Mikel. So uh, have a nice day, everyone. Bye all.